Why should we not exploit the extraordinary mineral wealth of the country? Why should we not exploit, for example, the huge gas reserves which are sitting below the Karoo? Huge controversy around fracking at the moment. Well, somebody who's got enormous experience as to why we should not irresponsibly be accessing these minerals and the gases that are sitting under the Karoo is a man called John Clark, who surprisingly is a social worker. What's a social worker doing causing trouble in the area of natural resources? Well, interestingly, you know, in the New South African Dispensation, the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, and particularly the Chapter 2, the Bill of Rights, spells out a rights culture and what's implied. And in my social work code of practice, the very first obligation we have as social workers is to uphold the fundamental rights as defined in the Constitution, in the Constitution, in respect to our clients, and to challenge injustices, social injustices. One of the Bill of Rights is the right to an environment protected for the benefit of present and future generations. So, you so, look, so from a social work perspective, it's the future generations right. that you're looking to protect by being an activist, if I can use the term, I know you don't like it, in areas like Pondoland, for example, the Transkei Wild Coast, where mineral resources there have been exploited. It is, and I mean, it's, you've got a four-year-old son. It's about the present, it's about what's going to happen to these youngsters in terms of the what's available for them in the future and I mean I've got more into under trying to understand economics from the perspective of people that are poor unfortunately there's a great distortion in the current economic thinking it tends to be far too abstract far too based on in sort of if I dare say in the sort of the narrow confines of the ivory towers of business schools where it all looks very fine on paper but a very simple premise, and it's really, I owe this to my friend Andrew Turton. He says, you need to understand that the global economic system is a wholly owned subsidiary <laughs> of the global ecological system. We cannot have an economy without an ecology. So when you start talking about natural resources, non-renewable natural resources specifically, I mean, in my article in Business Day, I talked about Henry Francis Finn shooting out all the ivory population or the elephants in Bonderland in 25 years. Yeah. We can still repopulate if that's what we wanted to because there are still elephants around. Take the titanium out in 25 years, you can't bring it back. But what is the purpose does the titanium serve if it's not there to be exploited? It's there to, f to, to achieve what I call the forward survival advantage of the human species into the future. But at some point somebody's going to use it. We happen to want to use it now. But we, must, but we have to take far, far, far greater care of a non-renewable resource in our regulatory frameworks than we would do so in a renewable resource. That's my concern. And if you put an unfortunate South Africa's history, let's take another, the, the previous big titanium beach fight, which was St. Lucia in the 1990s. Interestingly, we didn't have all the fantastic constitution and Bill of Rights, etc., that we now have and the environmental legislation. And it was essentially a political decision taken. We are not going to mine the dunes of St. Lucia. We're going to turn into a World Heritage Site. It's off limits to mining. Um, and it was some people, obviously, Richards Bay Minerals weren't happy with yeah. that. I've spoken to them, and they actually said it was the right decision. They've said it's the right decision, because even Richards Bay Minerals today do not, as a, as a policy issue, they will not go and mine environmentally sensitive areas, in areas of, 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 of where threatens to, to conservation, biodiversity, etc. Okay, so let's talk about fracking. Let's talk about the Karoo. The vast majority of people who ever go to the Karoo go through it as quickly as they possibly can. They don't see the beauty of the Karoo. They don't see it as biodiversity. They see that as a piece of scrub land that, if there is natural gas underneath it, should be exploited. Why not? Well, because uh, places of very high environmental sensitivity are the places where you learn we, 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 there's more to be learned from those situations than there are in situations where there's abundance. Because there are certain plant species, etc., which have evolved there because of the very unique situation that, that, that prevails there. So, and I'm not saying don't go fracking. I mean, my point is that I've made in the article, I've got a piece of platinum close to my heart. It keeps me alive. And so it's about saying, well, that, at least that little bit of platinum is hopefully contributing something <laughs> positive to the store of wisdom and knowledge of the human species um, and will keep my heart pumping so that we can just get a sense of perspective. Because my concern is that from Richards Bay in 1990s to South Africa and the Wild Coast in 2012, we are actually 
we've got all the laws now in place. We've got all the regulatory frameworks. And now, unfortunately, what we're seeing is a politically, I fear, driven interest. Not to benefit the local people, not to seek the beneficiation, but to actually further enrich certain you know, people that are at the top of the, the, the shareholding of Shell South Africa doesn't help, uh, of course, when you look at Chancellor House's involvement in Shell South exactly, Africa. So yeah. that is the assertion that here is a natural resource. If you're not exploiting the, national, uh, the natural resource for the good of the people of the country, then you're behaving like the Angolans do. Exactly. And, and what really got me going on this, Bruce, is that, and actually at Gibbs in 2006, we had a visit from a friend of mine, Chilean development economist Manfred Max Nier. And he told the story of how in Chile, in, in Valdivia, in this beautiful wetland where there's this iconic species known as the black neck swan, which is a, a tourist attraction. And I've been there and I visited it in 1996. How upstream on this waterland, they built a pulp mill for $100 million or something. And it was an investment in the economy. It was going to create jobs, etc., etc. And the environment was not going to be destroyed. When he was here in 2006, I nearly... He had another heart attack when he told me that there was an effluent spill upstream and it turned the entire Carlos Underwater Nature Reserve into a water desert, destroying it. And the logic and the rationale that had been put out for justifying that particular pulp mill sounded virtually out of the same book that I was hearing from the people promoting the mining of the Wild Coast and the end to Wild Coast toll road. Jobs, economic investment, development, addressing historic... It, it was virtually the same logic. It sounds so, like the same as the fracking story. And it is. And, and all I'm saying is that, you know, it's, and I don't, don't want to be too hard on the politicians. It's actually the economists, because the economists actually live in a, in a world which is actually a bit make-believe. And that's why I sort of put a poor old Benang on the spot there, because he talked about Shell having these 200-year scenarios into the future. And I say, well, you know, the logic of the way in which current economic thinking works is that it's about all about exchange and trade. But we, we've got this huge surplus of CO2 gases, and we better find somebody to trade with it. So has he found a planet nearby where we can start <laughs> that trade? Now, it sounds like I'm being sarcastic, but mm -hmm. if, you, if you boil it down, the assumption upon which modern economic, neoliberal economics is based is a fallacy. And that's why I go back to what Anthony Turton says. The global economic system is a wholly owned subsidiary for the global ecological system. So if you're going to use that shale gas in the Karoo, if you're going to use the titanium in the wild coast, the gold underneath, the let's make sure we are doing it with the very long-term perspective so that your children, grandchildren, etc. will actually benefit. And that's why my concern is that the traditional leadership system in Ponderland has been one of the things which thinks intergenerationally, whereas politicians think to the next election. In South Africa, that's three months away. We'll leave it at that point, because it's certainly thought-provoking. And as long as I can get a tender, I suppose, for part of the extraction of the fracking gas, my future generations will be fine. But maybe that's part of the problem. John Clark is a social worker par excellence.